I wanted to ask you about whether the left has won the culture war. Has the woke side won the culture war? So by default at the last election, Labour won with a smaller vote share than even in 2019 when repugnant communist Jeremy Corbyn was defeated by Boris Johnson with what we thought was an unshakable landslide majority, how fast things change in politics. But Lisa Nandy has declared unilateral victory, saying the culture war is over. No. What this is, it's a smokescreen for the resuming of a kind of on-rails politics that the managerial consensus, the likes of Tony Blair, whose institute is fueling the engine of the next Labour government, is propelling forwards. And this is governance by self-appointed experts. They presume to do everything in the best interest of the people they're acting behalf of. They proclaim it to be democratic, but it's it's actually a Hobson's choice. So there, there wasn't really much difference between the Conservative and Labour proposals. The only person that was putting up a properly different vision to the prevailing order, order was Nigel Farage, which is why he was so offensive to them. This is why the Labour Party, likes of Diane Abbott or the, or the now Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, have been talking about Farage as if he is the opposition in their minds rather than attacking the Conservative Party. They've been saying Rishi Sunak has been nothing but gracious handing off to them. And it's because, yeah, the agenda goes on unabated. The agenda is, first of all, that they're going to put forward a Race Equality Act, which is essentially racial communism. It's going to say that if there is any discrepancy in pay between a black and a white member of your corporation, no matter the seniority, no matter the hours worked, it's just in aggregate, then you're liable to American civil rights style lawsuits. Mm. So that creates ample opportunities for a grievance industrial complex to whip up racial animosity and make corporations, even if DEI and ESG is hemorrhaging them profits, adhere to these incentives. Mm. What's ESG? Environmental, social, and government scores. It's mm. like a corporate social credit system that compels you to do environmental activism, uh, intersectional race, gender mm. activism, and have good corporate governance, okay. which never actually happens. It never means that it's accountable. This One of the great test cases is there were oil companies that BlackRock had in BlackRock being one of the big hedge funds that created ESG mm -hmm. along with the United Nations uh, to they installed their activists on the boards of these oil companies and encouraged they divest away from fossil fuel manufacturing and towards renewable energies and also accompanying all that it was flying the pride flag every June and oh, right. donating to racial justice causes and the it's absurd stuff that doesn't accrue benefits to its shareholders, but instead creates an ideological monopoly over all of the market. And, and this is something that, that Starmer and the like are very interested in doing. And then the other side of this is, of course, the conversion therapy plan, which criminalizes therapists, parents, affirming biological reality to their gender-confused children. And bear in mind, we have had an exponential rise in the last decade since the advent of social media of 4,400% in adolescent girls identifying as trans. This itself is a smokescreen for familial abuse. I, I know someone that this has happened to. Um, it's a smokescreen for all sorts of mental health disorders. There were, I think, five to six comorbidities in the patient study that the, the internal the Tavistock carried out internally before mm. this exponential rise. It covers up for the fact that in the 11 long-term studies done before this rapid onset gender dysphoria that, that Lisa Littman has coined, there's a desistance rate of between 60 and 90%. The average number I've seen is about 80 to 85. And it covers up for the fact that the detransition rate is not 1%, as is often touted. The Tavistock internal study saw it about 25%. Another study that was cited in a policy exchange report called the Sleep at the Wheel in late 2022 was about 30%. So it could be as high as a third of people who have these irreversible surgeries and these surgical interventions come to regret it. And we wonder why the suicide rate remains about 40% even after all of these procedures have been inflicted on people. And the Labour Party are just going to keep driving that forward. And the reason they're going to keep driving that forward is because they have this liberal false anthropology that underneath everybody is a fundamental human sameness. And so all you have to do is repeal all of the interventions of institutions in people's lives, cultural influences, the baggage of history the influence of religion, even the influence of the family in the case of the say of parents over what their children are taught, and then we'll all reach the same conclusion. So that democracy, as in Zamyatin's We, that dystopian novel that inspired 1984, democracy is just an exercise in repeatedly making the same choice. It's basically a ritual, and in fact, the people that vote for populist parties are the threats to democracy, so that the vote itself is a, is a way of weeding out dissenters. 
And so anyone who is trying to drag those issues away from the managerial state and their agenda and put them back in the public square is fighting a divisive culture war, they're populists, and they're getting in the way of just driving a straight line along the long arc to a progressive utopia. And that's why, in their mind, those people need to be eliminated. And all of that might suggest, I mean, what you were talking about there, the, the, the trans issues, the race issues, the diversity, all the things that are winding so many people up at the moment, might suggest that the woke left, at least in the UK, has won the culture war then? They haven't won by popular consent, but I think that... Well, they were voted in. Yes, but not by the mm. majority of people. Uh, the, okay, so I think it's 23 votes per Labour MP, but a million vote per reform MP. Right, yes. Reform being it's a strange. insurgent party. Why, how does that make sense for, for those outside the country who don't understand what, what's how we vote? So the first pass of the post system means that votes are concentrated in certain constituencies. So you can get a large amount of the popular vote, but if it's not in a given location and it doesn't get your candidate over the mark, it doesn't translate to seats. We don't have a proportional representation system where as an aggregate of the popular vote, if one party gets 20%, then they get 20% of the seats in the House or Senate or Parliament or whatever institution that you have in your country. So Reform UK as an insurgent force, and I have my criticisms of them, but they position themselves as at least representing left behind people concerned about immigration and the outsourcing of manufacturing and the decline of the British economy and culture in towns like Ashfield and Clacton. These sort of refugee camps for people that feel they were pushed out of the big cities mm. by demographic and cultural change. Mm. Sort of the Appalachian equivalent, maybe, if we look at the hillbilly energy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's mm. sort of flavour of J.D. Vance, yeah. in, in a sense. And and there's a region Farage and Trump are friends. Farage obviously appealed to those people in Essex seaside towns. Trump appealed to the people in the swing states in the Rust Belt America that they felt they were looked over as manufacturing capacity was shipped off to China and free trade deals mm. were hollowing out the industrial base of America. And so lots of people were voting for them and they were combating battling uphill against the apathy of a conservative party that had rendered its own reputation radioactive because there were a lot of first time voters and a lot of red wall voters that came out to vote for Boris because they wanted to see Brexit pushed across the finish line. And then Matt Goodwin, who you've had on your show before, did some polling a couple of years in after lockdown. And he said that six in 10 people who voted for the conservatives in 2019 were not flipping to Labour. They weren't voting at all. So. Hmm. mass apathy had taken hold because if the political system repeatedly makes promises as the Conservatives did in 2010 and 2015 and 2017 and 2019 and 2024 to lower migration and then don't do it and deliver world historical levels of record net migration, then people are going to go, well, democracy is a total sham. Everyone lies hmm. to me. What's the point of participating in this process? We can't have a political solution. Now, that leads to dangerous places. And so I would prefer there were a political solution. But the more that issues are pushed beyond the bounds of political debate and the more that different political systems act in concert to keep out insurgent populist forces like a Trump or a Farage, then the more you're going to turn that apathy and despair into anger. And I, I would much prefer there a political solution to these problems than that boiling over into something far less savoury.